Good morning. It is so great to be here. I am so appreciative uh, for the invitation. Thanks so much for Pastor Dave for allowing me to come back. For those who may not know me, uh, you're very fortunate. Uh, but uh, until 16 months ago, I had the privilege uh, for eight years of, uh, of uh, serving this church, serving this church family as Minister of Pastoral Care. And uh, it's a, it's a gr- you're a great people, a great church, and it has just been very, very wonderful to be back with you this morning. I am really, really, really grateful. We're going to open with prayer. Shall we do that? Lord, thank you so much for all that you are for us because of Christ and uh, for allowing us to uh, begin to move into this holy week on this Palm Sunday. And uh, even though, Lord, we love Christmas, I love Christmas. I love it when you bring the snow at Christmas. I'd rather it be, <laughs> I'd rather it be uh, warm outside today, but Lord, you are good, and we know that this is just a passing thing. But Lord, you're always with us, and you're a great and amazing God uh, and that changes lives in amazing ways. Thank you so much for uh, allowing us to hear from your word. It is the foundation for our faith. If we did not have the Holy Scriptures, we could not know you. We could not experience you, and we would not know the uh, powerful transformation that you have worked, are working, and will work in our lives. So, Lord, thank you for your word now. Uh, Give us ears to hear, and uh, most of all, for myself and all of my friends here today, that we would put its teachings into practice. Thank you, Lord, in your holy name. Amen. All right, well, perhaps you have heard of the term public enemy, public enemy. What you may not know is that the term was coined by the commissioner of the Chicago Crime Commission in 1930. Yeah, the commissioner of the Crime Commission uh, right here in Chicago in 1930 coined the term as a reference to those who were considered known criminals but who had not been arrested and found guilty for their crimes. And the crime commissioner listed them as public enemies. And uh, guess who the commissioner listed as public enemy number one? Yes, Chicago's own Al Capone, the great gangsta. Yes, uh, he ruled the roost here for a while. Of course, eventually he was arrested by the FBI. He served seven years in jail, and uh, then he was released. He was very, very sick, and he died in my hometown of Miami, Florida in 1947. How about that? Yeah. Of course, the history is littered with, um, with public enemies, people who committed all kinds of atrocities, murdered others, did unspeakable, horrific, and terrible things. Uh, of course, you know, uh, people who became public enemies, if you knew them when they were younger, when they were children or teenagers, uh, many of them were admired. Many of them were respected. You know, uh, it was, uh, their friends, their families would say of them uh, wonderful things that, that looked like they were going to be very successful in all kinds of areas of life. And uh, you would never know that the day would come when history would record them as public enemies. Well, but of course, even the Bible itself uh, describes the devil not with horns and a tail, with, with red leotards, I guess he's probably traded those in for red yoga pants now, um, but, but this beautiful angel who, if you and I saw him, he would just be overwhelmingly beautiful, wondrous, an amazing being to behold. So, of course, we should never evaluate someone based on their appearance. Rather, we evaluate people based on their character. Character and actions determines the measure of a person. Not their appearance, not their intelligence, not their gifts, not their abilities. And that's why on this Palm Sunday I've entitled my message with what is often, what is being considered a shocker, and that is Jesus Christ, public enemy number one. Yeah, it seems heretical, it seems offensive, but give me a few minutes to tell you why Uh, The people of Jerusalem were throwing a parade for Jesus on that Palm Sunday while a small group, mostly Jewish leaders, 
were plotting behind doors to murder him. So here we go, expectations. Expectations color every part of our lives. Every part of our lives. Now, of course, there's two different kinds of expectations. We have realistic expectations, and then we have... Yes, there's a, 17 of you are awake. It's so good. I, I'm sure that the rest of you will wake up on the way. Yes, yes we have unrealistic expectations. And uh, realistic expectations will lead you to success in almost every area, and especially in the spiritual realm, but unrealistic expectations will lead you to your greatest failures, sorrows, and misery. So here's a great uh, five-word unrealistic expectation that almost every single one of us has believed. You know, we believe that al almost all of our lives. If we don't believe it anymore, that's unusual, uh, but we've all known this, and so I'm going to say the five, five words, and you're going to shout out the last word because you know it so well. Here we go. Unrealistic expectation. It won't happen to me. That's right. It won't happen to me, baby. No, 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 no. It won't happen to me. Uh-uh. Liar, liar, liar. Oh, my goodness. And who do we lie to the most? Ourself. That's right. So here's some, how, how about these? How many times have you thought in your lives, oh, it won't happen to me. It won't happen to me. I'm getting married next week, and my marriage is not going to be like my parents. It's not going to be like my siblings. It's not going to be like my friends. No, that won't happen to me. And uh, when I hear my kids, my kids won't grow up and be like those kids over there. My kids are not going to be like the ones that I see in Walmart over there. No, they're not going to act like that. No, not my kids. They won't be like that. Uh, I'll always have enough money. I'll, I won't go into debt like other people do. And I can watch this. I can smoke that. I can drink this. I can go there. And I won't be addicted like other people are addicted. That won't happen to me. Right. How's that been working for you? Oh, yeah. Unrealistic expectations. Uh, they'll do you in every time. So here comes Jesus, riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So uh, I'm going to have you stand, and we're going to read this uh, passage together, or I'll read the passage, but let's stand to do honor to God's word. So we're told the next day the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down to ro the road to meet him. And they shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem, for your king comes to you uh, humble and riding on a donkey. Amen. God bless his holy word. You may be seated. Now, huge crowds had come from all over the Roman Empire to celebrate this Passover. It was one of the holiest, uh, uh, holiest times of the year. Uh, and uh, this Passover, though, it's going to be unlike any Passover that they've ever had. It's going to make that very first Passover, the Passover where Moses... Uh, their ancestors under Moses were liberated from slavery in Egypt 1,500 years earlier. It's going to seem that, make that Passover seem like a picnic because this Passover is going to change the world forever, forever. This is what the Jews have been waiting for all these centuries and this is what the people who are there have been waiting for all their lives. Because the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. The, the, the son of David, the king, the divinely predicted king. And he's going to establish God's kingdom on earth. The Romans are going to be overthrown. Indeed, Jesus will set up God's kingdom and all of the nations, the goyim, were going to be subservient to the Jews and the Jews will rule and reign with Jesus in this golden time where the kingdom of God covers, as Isaiah said, the face of the earth. And not only would he usher in God's government, but with it there will be immense prosperity. 
and their diseases will be destroyed, and there won't be any more ignorance or illiteracy or infant fatalities, no more violence or, or, or fighting or pain, no more tears or weeping, only joy, only laughter, only blessings that never end. See, that's the expectation that the Jews had. This was the Messiah that they had been told about for hundreds of years and for those who were there all of their lives. And uh, Jesus uh, fit, the, uh, uh, fit this expectation perfectly. Uh, Indeed.com, he would fit that, those requirements right on. Because after all, uh, he had performed miracle signs and wonders. He had, he had preached with authority. He cared about the misfits and the poor and the marginalized. And he railed against the rich and the political elite. And he's riding on a donkey. Uh, the powerful tradition that all the Jewish kings did when they were coming for their coronation, when they are going to be crowned the king of Israel. And so, uh, no wonder the, the crowds are there by the thousands and thousands shouting out their hosannas, hallelujah, praises be, hail the king of Israel. And this was the day that they had dreamed of all for a millennia and all of their lives. And even the Jewish leaders were so upset. It says, then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Everyone's gone after him. This is the end of our world. Look, there is, he's unstoppable. Uh, there is, there's nothing we can do. But, don't you hate those big butts? Now, I'm not talking about the ones you're seated on. This is a G-rated message. But Jesus didn't turn out to be the kind of ex, uh, realistic, expected Messiah that they thought he would be. Indeed, he turned out to be the very opposite of everything they expected, which is why, let's see, that's Palm Sunday. Uh, let's see, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, only five days later, five days later, they would be shouting out something very different from Hosanna's hallelujahs and praises God, right? They're going to be shouting out, crucify him, liar, deceiver, false prophet, crucify him, crucify him. Unrealistic and false expectations. They'll disappoint and defeat you every time. But then, the unexpected happened. Three days later, guess what? Boom! He rises from the dead. Oh my goodness, and now his followers are jubilant. And now we're ready for a new parade because now Jesus is going to usher in God's kingdom as they expected. And so we're told in Acts chapter 1, he's resurrected. So, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Notice it says, they kept asking him. They kept asking him. They kept asking him. They kept asking him. Now, for those who have been in this church family for a long time, uh, know that I've been raising my grandson, uh, who is here today. We've had him since birth. He's seven years old. I've let him live. That's, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> but it's like deja vu. It's like going back 30 years. When we go on a, on a long road trip, guess what I hear? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's like, we've got 300 miles to go. Is that far? Oh, 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 really? Gosh, Lord. But notice, they just kept asking him because they could not shake this deep-seated belief that Jesus was the Messiah according to their long-held, ingrained expectations. But once again, Jesus would dash their expectations. Because now he told them he's going to leave. Leave? You just got here. You just rose from the dead. Where are you going? And they watched him do a Harry Houdini and levitate on the spot. And up he goes. And they're just watching. Watching. Up. 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 Until the clouds take him out of their eyes. And I'm sure these apostles are scratching their heads, wondering 
what in the world is going on? But Jesus said, you have to stay here until the Holy Spirit comes in 50 days, and he's going to empower you to take my message and start my movement that's going to recreate the human race. The old human race has fallen. I'm going to create a movement for new humans. I'm going to make, take people and make new people out of them. And you're going to be the heralds of that recreation. Wow. That would mean, you know, these, these guys are going to have to change their expectations radically. In fact, they're going to have to junk every expectation they have of who the Messiah was and what he would do. Because Jesus had come to ruin their lives. I mean, he'd come to ruin their lives. I mean, just think about it. Three years earlier, what did he do? He said, come and follow me. And what, did they, what happened when they went and followed, and followed him? They had to forsake their parents. They had to forsake their relatives. They had to forsake their wives and their children. They had, to, they had to abandon their careers and put at risk their reputations. You see, Jesus wasn't the safe and secure, easy follow teacher and savior that he was expected to be on that Palm Sunday. And nothing's changed in the 1988 Palm Sundays since then. In fact, even before Palm Sunday, the Apostle John records that most of Jesus' followers and admirers had already forsaken him because he was too radical and he demanded too much. And he was out of touch with the culture and the world around him. They left him because they saw that he could be dangerous, that he said crazy things. And following him further would lead them not only to their own deaths, but the deaths of their own families and everything that they held dear. They, the Jesus they thought they knew and loved turned out to be a public enemy that would endanger everyone and everything they knew and loved. And the crazy thing is, Jesus' followers down to this very day, this very day, we still cling to a lot of unrealistic things about Jesus. Now, it's certainly as if it, you know, Jesus hasn't plainly told us what it would mean to follow him. Look at the words of Matthew 10. Shocking. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. Whoa. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. For if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. And if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Those are shocking, shocking words. This is not the Jesus that most professing Christians signed up to follow. And it certainly isn't the meek, mild, humble, sweet, loving Jesus that our culture thinks of him as. Jesus was very clear. He says, I didn't come to bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace. I'm not a peacemaker. I've come to take a sword to your life. I didn't come. It's not freedom from pain, anguish and disappointment. Not freedom from cancer, accidents, job losses or bankruptcies. Not freedom from poverty, racism and government tyranny. Not freedom from abuse, sexual slavery, unjust imprisonment, or manipulation by people who are more powerful than you. Jesus said he would take a sword to our lives, that our enemies would be members of our own household. And not only them, but there would be others who would persecute us, jail us, enslave us, and kill us and our families. He told us that if we followed, he says, the world hates me. And if you sincerely decide 
to be my disciple, the world will hate you too. Hundreds of thousands of believers, maybe millions of believers in the last 2,000 years, down to this very day, I get persecution uh, magazine in, in my email. And every day, I read about atrocities being done against Christians in Nigeria, in Egypt, in Iran, Iraq, Korea, India, all over the place. Christians have suffered immensely, have been killed and massacred, have been beaten and slandered, have known every kind of spiritual, emotional, physical, relational, and pain inflicted upon humanity. And if that weren't bad enough, we have a big target on our back because we have the most evil, wicked, malevolent being in the universe against us, the devil and all of its minions. So Jesus really is your and my personal public enemy because he's out to ruin our lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German Christian who led an underground movement against Adolf Hitler in the 1930s under Nazi Germany, wrote in his classic book, The Cost of Discipleship, this famous line, when God calls a man, he bids him come and die. When God calls a woman, he bids her come and die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hung by the neck because he dared to follow Jesus. And he refused to believe and live by the false teachings and the public values of his government and of his culture. You see, Jesus has to ruin me, and he has to ruin you. That is the old-natured us. Because the Bible says we are born spiritually dead to God. We're disconnected from God because we don't want God. We don't know God. The only God we want to follow is my favorite three, me, myself, and I. I want to be God. You want to be God. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me where to go. Don't tell me what I can say or not say. I'll do well what I dang want to do. And I don't want you or anybody else telling me what to do. I'm in charge of my life. I'll do what I want to do. I'll live what I want to do. I love Nike. Just do it, because that's me. You see, that's the person, the old-natured us, that Jesus has to tear down. He's got to uproot and demolish our old-natured lives and whatever is standing in the way of why he came and what he wants to do in us. And what is that? Well, it's to rebuild us. It's to renew us. It's to make us into different human beings who would be like him. People who would radiate his, not the world's, his kind of love and joy and peace and light and greatness. He didn't come to make us happy. He came to make us holy. But as we grow in holiness, abracadabra, guess what? We become happy. We experience a joyful happiness that this world cannot understand. And now both the pagan Romans who didn't believe in any god, and all the polytheistic Romans who believed in, let's say, Mars, Venus, Saturn, Jupiter, all that's all the planets, and worshipped in those temples. They could not believe the way that Christians among them lived and died in those early centuries. And they were blown away by their love and their courage, a love and a courage that they had never seen among people before. And, and, the, and, and Christian and the church swept like wildfire through the Roman Empire. Because following Jesus may at first ruin your life, but he would remake you and give you a life full of joyful abundance, of singing and dancing, of wholeness and freedom. So Jesus would lead us into an adventurous parade a Palm Sunday parade that would indeed usher in God's kingdom 
but it, first it would be in our hearts. Stand up, everybody, please, because Jesus has ushered in God's kingdom in our hearts, and the day is coming when he's going to return, and it won't be long now, and he is going to set up the kingdom of God on earth, and in there, he's going to, there'll be freedom from every evil, disease, sorrow, oppression, injustice, and death. So let there be shouting. Let there be praises. Let praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for coming for us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for recreating us. Thank you into making us new people who would know your joy, your freedom, your grace, your mercy, and your greatness. Continue to work in us. Continue to transform us. Continue to do your supernatural work in us and through us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As the prayer warriors come on up front, may the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to set you free, to make you whole, to give you a love this world doesn't know, a joy this world can't comprehend, a peace that is beyond this world, changing and transforming your life, may he continue to do a powerful supernatural work in you, and may you continue to be a testimony of his greatness, of his goodness, of his love, and of his joy. Amen and amen. Go in peace.